Hello, and welcome to History is Gay, a podcast that examines the underappreciated and overlooked queer ladies, gents, and gentle envies that have always been there in the unexplored corners of history, because history has never been as straight as you think. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Thank you for tuning in to History is Gay this time around. And as always, uh, I'm Lee. Hello. Uh, I bet you're getting really sick of my voice being the only one up in the introduction here. Um, Thank you, everyone, for your patience in this episode. Uh, Things have been a little rough. The pandemic has been hard. Uh, So this, this this is our November episode. Uh, just pretend that we like put out a spooky Halloween episode in your brain. Today, I have a wonderful guest host who is a friend of friend of the pod and friend of the podcast host and friend in real life. Uh, I would like to introduce everyone to my wonderful friend, Amanda Helton, who will be here to talk with me today about Michelangelo because she's all artsy fartsy and works at an artsy fartsy museum. Uh, and you know how I love artsy fartsy museum friends here. So hi, Amanda. Hello. <laughs> hi. <Thank laughs> what an that. introduction. <laughs> Thank you for that introduction. That was great. Um, yeah. So my name is Amanda. I use she, her pronouns. Um, I'm originally from Southeast Tennessee, uh, Sevier County. If you're familiar, it's the birthplace of Dolly Parton. And yes, I have met her on several occasions. Uh, no big deal. <laughs> Amanda wrote this in our outline, and I had just like watched a bunch of Dolly Parton <laughs> shit. So I've been like like way up on on Dolly recently, yeah. and so like I just like highlighted it in our Google Doc, and I was like, "You've met Dolly Parton." It was like very very important note in the outline. Yeah. So I've I work at an art museum <laughs> in Silicon Valley. Uh, here in the Bay Area, and I've been working in museums for about eight years now. Um, I have a master's degree in art history with a concentration in museum training from the George Washington University in Washington, D.C. So so artsy-fartsy. Yeah. Artsy-fartsy, yeah. Officially. Yeah. I paid Officially. a lot of money for that artsy-fartsy title. <laughs> <laughs> your, your diploma actually... I'm still like, paying for that title. <laughs> yeah, yeah, same. Same Zs. <laughs> So yeah, let's let's get into it. Um, so this episode, we're talking about Michelangelo, the uh, famous Italian Renaissance artist who you may know from such hits as David and Pieta and the Sistine Chapel. Mm-hmm, <laughs> like like mm-hmm. such hits, the biggies, the biggies, yeah. just the big ones. <laughs> we're gonna you know go into a whole bunch of things. Uh, in terms of content warnings for this episode, in general, homophobia. Uh, both external and internalized homophobia, which we'll talk about a little bit towards towards the end of Michelangelo's life. And uh, there will just be a brief discussion or mention of period-specific pederasty. So if those are things that you want to skip over, we will put... uh, It's a little bit more general, but we'll put any specific uh, portions in our time codes in the outline as usual in the show notes. Today's going to be a people-focused episode, so we'll go into a bio of Michelangelo, and then we will go into uh, why we think he's gay, and we'll end the podcast, as always, with how gay were they, our personal ranking about how likely it is that they weren't straight. I mean, before we we start a little bit, I figured since since you're coming from an art history background, I wanted to ask you, Amanda, what was your kind of introduction to Michelangelo? How did you come around? I mean, other than just like household name? Well, of course, he comes up in every survey class, I think you take in undergrad. Probably. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. So you just like, if you have an art history degree, you just like, you graduate with, like, a certain amount of knowledge about Michelangelo, you know? (laughs) Like, he's just had this, you know, ridiculous impact, I think, on art in general. There's a lot of myth about him, you know, and a lot of speculation. So I think it'll be really interesting for us to especially get into the letters and things, 
because that's not something that was ever really part of my art education <laughs> around yeah <Michelangelo. laughs> right um, uh, t- to be fair I had um, professors who were very um, like they were very much willing to talk about like artists sexualities and their like real lives and how that impacted the art that they made and you know the the social conditions of the world at that time and so i think that's definitely something that's like on the brain <laughs> so yeah that'll be that'll be exciting for me <laughs> that's a that's a perfect segue into uh discussing a little bit about our kind of historical context so uh let's get into our main topic of michelangelo besotted with beefcake <laughs> which is what we're titling this episode, and we can thank our our favorite resident queer historian, uh, Richter Norton, for that lovely little play <laughs> yes. on words um, <laughs> that that showed up in one of the articles. What a and gift! <laughs> what a gift! What a what gift! A gift. Um, I also tried really, really hard for you all to figure out some sort of uh, Ninja Turtles pun. <laughs> But uh, the brain was not working. So just, you know, if you come up with a beautiful Ninja Turtles pun that works for this episode, email me at historyisgaypodcast at gmail.com. Uh, I'm not going to change the episode, but I will share them on Twitter. <laughs> uh, okay, so we're going to go into some historical context. So let's start off by talking a little bit about the Italian Renaissance, which is where we are setting our scene. So generally considered uh, the, you know, 15th century is like the early Renaissance, late 1400s to about 1520 is what's considered the high Renaissance. And there's a lot that is specifically focused in Italy, um, especially in, in Florence. Uh, the 15th and 16th centuries more broadly was like a period in European history generally regarded as a cultural rebirth, marking the transition from the Middle Ages to modernity. So there was a lot of, there was a return to classical ideas in art and society, really hearkening back to what we saw in ancient Greece and Rome. They really elevated those um, artistic ideals and were like, hey, let's bring this back. Um Italy of the 15th century was uh, not a kind of unified country as we like to think of it now. It was more of a collection of small republics. So the the most influential being Florence, Genoa, and Venice. And each of these was under the governorship of the Pope in Rome. During this period, there were many innovations that were made in mathematics, medicine, engineering, architecture, and visual arts. Who basically came out of the Middle Ages with a huge swath of change. And some of the most celebrated figures of Renaissance Italy, for example, uh, da Vinci was an artist and a scientist and an inventor. So people were really kind of taking all of this change in very holistically and doing a whole bunch of stuff. Right, right. And generally speaking, um, on the art side, uh, In the 15th century, some of the most impactful developments um, were a renewed interest in perspectival systems. So um, wanting really to depict anatomy correctly, um, to make things look really natural. Um, And in classical culture and literature generally, um, there was this real renewed interest. Um, So we couldn't and we definitely couldn't talk about those developments without mentioning uh, Filippo Brunelleschi, uh, who is best known for the Florence Cathedral's Red Dome. Arguably, though, w- just as important was his rediscovery of linear perspective. And I think it's important, I say rediscovery because I think it's important to note that he didn't, like, discover linear perspective. <laughs> there were ancient cultures, um, in particular the Greeks and Romans, who did know how to convey depth in an image. What Brunelleschi observed is that parallel lines appear to converge at a single point in the distance with a single fixed point of view. And so he discovered a method for calculating depth um, that was implemented by painters, sculptors, and architects alike to lend greater realism to their work. So 
At the beginning of the 15th century, styles definitely fluctuated. So when you look at the art of that period, you're going to see kind of a a little bit of, of a, a, an amalgam of different conventions. So there's sort of more gothic conventions alongside newer experimenting with perspective and naturalism. So you get kind of sometimes some images that look kind of weird <laughs> where they're kind of like <laughs> In between, like stitched, um, with, stitched it's like, together. I see you. I see what you did there with that cloth, but I don't buy it. Um, you know, so <laughs> it's just kind of, you know, it was a process um, to kind of get to the 16th century, where you know we're seeing like mannerism and where pe- where artists are like intentionally like subverting naturalism, where they're, like, making people's necks really long or, like, whatever they're doing, right? So another thing uh, that was different uh, during the Renaissance was that it marked a turn away from the anonymity of artists in the medieval um, period, um, where whereas medieval artists didn't sign their work, they weren't considered really artists, per se, um, the Renaissance artist was associated with divine inspiration, which elevated the individual status of artists, as well as claimed greater social respect for the visual arts. So it was a real, a really big turning point um, for artists um, during the Renaissance. Um, And that's, I think, important to think about, um, especially in relationship to Michelangelo and the way he was perceived in his time and the way that he perceived himself, uh, especially later in his life, sort of reflecting on the way the world saw him. So moving on, this period also involved discovery of like classical writings from the Greek and Roman uh, eras. And so this inspired a humanist outlook. Renaissance culture idealized, as you said before, antiquity and promoted the study of the liberal arts centered primarily around individual's intellectual potential. So the idea of elevating like a singular artist as as opposed to more collectivist ideas. So Mm -hmm. the primary goal of Renaissance art was to combine the classical antiquity with Christianity and to position Greek and Roman philosophers as like precursors to Christian prophets. This resurgence of classical themes and mythological narratives lends itself to the realm of fantasy, and it created opportunities to depict same-sex desire. Uh, We have linear perspective and the concept of an open window through which the artist sees the painting's subject also led to the pursuit of more realism in art, as uh, Amanda mentioned before. And we're also dealing with a deeply, deeply misogynistic culture, uh, which was taking its cues from a deeply misogynistic Greek and Roman culture. I think for me, something really important to always think about, and I think I briefly mentioned this before, was just thinking about the conditions of artistic production and what it would have been like to be an artist at this time. Um, so I think it's important to note that most social spaces during this period were homosocial, especially among the upper classes. Uh, most environments in particular um, s- that were central to the creation of art, uh, like workshops, were definitely segregated by gender and they weren't typically accessible to women. Painting, sculpture, and architecture were the main um, fields that dominated the Italian Renaissance. So the painters and sculptors and architects are all sort of competing against each other, trying to outdo each other. There were a lot of rivalries, a lot of arguments. There are painters trying to depict figures who are looking in mirrors and pools of water, sculptures that are capturing the texture of skin, and architects that are adding painting and sculpture to the facades of their buildings. Um, so there were a lot of Most artists kind of fell into a a certain camp. Um, Michelangelo was famously in favor of sculpture, stating that, quote, there is as much difference between painting and sculpture as between shadow and truth, Um, which, one, is incredibly dramatic, but two, (laughs) um, shows you that he had a very strong sense of his connection to sculpture. Um, And he really 
didn't like painting. No. Anytime, <laughs> anytime somebody was truth. like, can you do a painting? He was just like, <laughs> fine. Yeah. Yep. Which is so funny, considering that he's probably most well known for a for giant painting. painting. <laughs> he would Whoops. probably have hated that. <laughs> oh, yeah. Let's get into some some background on Michelangelo. Let's talk about his life. Uh, so there's going to be a lot of Italian in this episode, and neither one of us speak Italian, so we're going to do our best with uh, our pronunciations. So Michelangelo de Lodovico Buonarroti Simoni, uh, he was... An Italian Renaissance painter, sculptor, architect, and poet. He was born March 6th, 1475 in Caprese in the Republic of Florence. And he lived until February 18th, 1564, where he died in Rome in in the Papal States. Um, Many of his artworks are some of the most famous in the world, including the Sistine Chapel. As an artist who was famous in his own time, and I think that's really important to think about, is that he's one of the few people whose life was incredibly well documented, and people knew about his artwork while he was alive and were talking about it and even writing about it. Uh, He was the first Western artist to publish his biography before his death, and there were even competing biographies at the time. Uh, The first was the final chapter in a series of artists' lives from 1550 by a painter and architect named Giorgio Vasari, and it was the only chapter on a living artist, and he regarded Michelangelo's works as the culminating perfection of art. Uh, Many writers have described Michelangelo as the archetype of a brooding and difficult artist. Uh, You'll hear many a time that he was very much, uh, in our opinion, a drama queen. He was deeply masculine and hot-tempered and was well-known for his volatile moods, which at one point even caused a rival artist to punch him in the nose, breaking it and leaving it forever crooked. Even though he grew to be a relatively wealthy man, he lived in near squalor. Uh, He rarely changed his clothes. Uh, Some even said that his clothes were so dirty and basically plastered onto his body that when he died, they needed to be cut or peeled from him. Uh, There's a lovely quote here from Rector Norton who describes him as broken-nosed, lean, with bushy black hair and piercing eyes, arrogantly confident yet hypersensitive, striving towards the perfection of an unbreakable column, producing a corpus of magnificent monuments for at least the base of that column. Michelangelo forever remains the epitome of a particularly masculine genius, which today we call machismo. Michelangelo was born on March 6th, 1475 in central Italy's remote Apennine Mountains in Caprice's small village. His parents were Francesca di Neri Bonorati and Lodvico di Leonardo Bonorati. His father, Lodvico, was a low-level sort of government official in the town. Um, I, I found a couple different accounts of, like, what exactly his dad's job was, <laughs> but um, I couldn't really find consensus, but definitely a government official unclear what he actually did for the government. When Michelangelo was six months old, the family moved to Florence and bought a small farm near the village of Settignano. This is where Michelangelo spent much of his early years under the care of a wet nurse, um, which was super common at the time uh, for people to send children away for like the first two years of their life. Um, And Michelangelo's wet nurse was married to a stonecutter. Um, And later when Michelangelo would establish himself as a sculptor, he would say, quote, he had drunk marble dust with his nurse's milk, end quote. What a fucking drama queen from the start. (laughs) He created his own myth. Yeah, 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 he totally mythologized he himself. Totally He's like, did. I was a genius from a baby because of this. God. <laughs> yeah. At three, Michelangelo returned to Florence to live with his family, who were not doing well. Uh, the farm was struggling, his father's government wages were low, and the family had grown a great deal. Lots of babies. Not a lot of contraception in Renaissance Italy. Uh, when Michelangelo was six, his mother died. Uh, leaving behind five young sons, including a newborn. Uh, As he attended uh, Santa Croce in Florence for Mass every Sunday as a child, this specific church um, 
the art in that church must have been some of the first to which Michelangelo was exposed. In 1485, Lodovico, uh, Michelangelo's father, married a wealthy woman, Lucrezia... Oh gosh, here we go. It's an Italian. Lucrezia Degli Ulbaldini Gagliano, who brought a 600 florin dowry to the union. This development completely changed life for Michelangelo's family. It allowed his father to afford to send Michelangelo to a Latin school to learn reading, writing, and math. Michelangelo was pretty bored at school, uh, which is a, a common theme among many of our, our luminary geniuses that we've talked about on this show, but he did fall in love with poetry. He became convinced that he was meant to be an artist. However, at the time, artists were considered low-value workers, so we're, you know, coming into the Renaissance, and, you know, not certainly respected professionals. So Ludovico was, wasn't was pleased and wanted Michelangelo to pursue something more respectable, something that would, you know, continue this this transition of the family into some relative wealth. So Michelangelo would meet... Francesco Granacci, who is an older boy, um, who was also an aspiring artist. And Francesco was apprenticing with Domenico Gurlandio. And the Gurlandio brothers ran the most successful studio in Florence. Um, and they were, they got very consistent work, mostly decorating churches. Um, and Granacci would actually go on to help Michelangelo a bit with the Sistine Chapel painting. Um, so he didn't do it all himself, but, <laughs> you know, he had some help, but yeah. Um, Francesco encouraged Michelangelo and showed his drawings to Gerlandio, uh, who then wanted to take Michelangelo on as an apprentice. And although Michelangelo's father didn't super want him to be an artist, he eventually allowed him to pursue the apprenticeship when he was about 12 years old, which seems so young. Um, <laughs> I don't know. Just like, I'll you're 12, go get a baby. job. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you're 12, go find a career. Um, well, Michelangelo... when your life expectancy is like 60. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right, exactly. That's true. Perspective. Um, Michelangelo would copy Gerlandio's work, which was super common for apprenticeships. Um, but what Michelangelo would do was copy his teacher's work and then declare his to be superior. He would say that he had made improvements. <laughs> uh, so he was super confident, very sure of himself, super impatient, especially when it came to learning frescoes, which was primarily what I think he learned from Gerlandio, Ger which he did not enjoy doing. He did not like frescoes. He did not like painting in general. Um, so Gerlandio realized Michelangelo's talent, but disliked his attitude about it, basically. <laughs> um, and the final straw came when Michelangelo decided to go over some of Gerlandio's work with a pen to correct them. <laughs> and that got him kicked out. <laughs> so Michelangelo pretty much decided that painting wasn't for him. Uh, he really wanted to pursue sculpture. While he was at Gerlandio's, uh, the apprenticeship, it was visited by some of the ruling uh, Medici family, uh, specifically Bertoldo di Giovanni, uh, who was an elderly sculptor who was employed by Lorenzo de' Medici, uh, who was at the time the most powerful man in Florence. And so after leaving Gerlandio's workshop, Michelangelo reached out to Bertoldo and started bringing sculpture to Lorenzo's garden, which Lorenzo de' Medici had this garden space where he invited artists to gather and draw, sculpt, and they could get feedback from Bertoldo and instruction. Um, and it became very clear that Michelangelo's skills were beyond the other artists in the garden. And uh, so, so that was really where the jealousy kind of started. Um, there were some rivalries that came out of that. Lorenzo ended up giving Michelangelo a room and paid him an allowance. This gave him the sort of professional stability to really focus on sculpture um, and perfecting that chosen art form. Um, and at this time, he made Battle of the Centaurs and the Madonna of the Steps, which are two well-known pieces. 
When Lorenzo died in 1492, his son Piero took over and didn't much care for sculpture. Um, and my impression was he didn't really care a lot about Michelangelo. <laughs> he didn't really care about like <laughs> – he was like, what is this? Who is this guy who has, like, a room? And, like, why are we doing this? Um, so he didn't give Michelangelo any work until the winter when he actually commissioned him to make a snowman, um, <laughs> which apparently is a thing. I thought I was when I read it at first, I thought this is like a one off thing. But apparently making snowman snowmen <laughs> were pretty common. Um it rarely snowed in Florence, but there was a tradition among artists to create them all over the city when it did. So in January of 1495, there was a really heavy snowfall, and Piero de' Medici commissioned Michelangelo to construct, construct a colossal snowman in the courtyard of his palace for the winter festival. I just, I want to know what that snowman <laughs> looked like. I know, I want to know so like, bad. <laughs> is it is it the three balls? Or <laughs> yeah. basically we move on to... Michelangelo getting some new patrons and leaving Florence. Uh, so the prior, the prior of Santo Spirito asked him to make a crucifix for his church, and he was so pleased with it that he gave Michelangelo a room in the church to work. Here he began uh, dissecting human cadavers and learning about the human body and was one of the first people to do so in this way. In 1494, King Charles VIII of France led an army that threatened to overrun Florence, so many people fled from the Republic, including Michelangelo, who traveled to Bologna and Venice in search of work. Gianfresco Aldrovani, a local noble and politician in Bologna, commissioned Michelangelo to complete unfinished figures at San Domenico's shrine in the church of the same name. He was given room, board, and materials that were covered, and... Again, other artists who had to struggle much harder became really jealous of this guy who seemed to be getting everything he needed just because he was talented. Uh, back in Florence, a priest, Girolamo Savonrola, had led an overthrow of the Medici family. So when the French invasion threat occurred, the Medici family had fled Venice and Savonrola was left to take power. He was known for his prophecies of civic glory, the destruction of secular art and culture, and his calls for a Christian renewal. Um, Savonrola did influence Michelangelo and Botticelli and other artists as well towards a stronger religiosity. In 1495, Michelangelo returned to Florence and got in touch with some of the Medici family living under false names <laughs> at the time. Um Lorenzo di Pier Francesco de' Medici asked Michelangelo to help sell a statue that Michelangelo had made earlier, and it was of the Roman god of love, Cupid. Michelangelo aged the figure to look like an ancient work that had been buried, smearing it with dirt, and he passed it off to a buyer in Rome, Cardinal Riario. He's just starting starting off everything with forgery. It's fine. Like yeah. let's make this look like let's make this look like a like a like a legit ancient yeah sculpture. yeah. Lorenzo was like, "Commit a crime for me, please." And Michelangelo was like, "Sure thing." Be gay, do crime. <laughs> Here we go. Yeah. Um. So so in Rome, when he went to go sell this fake <laughs> faked antiquity, basically, um. He met a lot of influential people and members of the Borgia family, um, which included the Pope. Uh, so Cardinal Riario commissioned a statue of Bacchus, the Greek god of wine and celebrations. However, the Cardinal didn't end up liking the work because he thought that the Bacchus looked too drunk and <laughs> kind of wayward and he refused to pay for it. Um, and it was around this time that Michelangelo received word from his father that the family was struggling financially, um, and he needed a new big commission to support both himself and his family. Um, so it was like super bad timing. <laughs> so in in 1496, he was commissioned by French ambassador Cardinal Jean Billeres de La Grolla. Sure. Um, to create a sculpture of the Virgin Mary cradling a dead Jesus. 
uh, a subject which is referred to as the Pieta. He worked on the Pieta for two years, and it was displayed in the Vatican, and the work was so well received that this basically catapulted Michelangelo into fame, and many, many more patrons suddenly began commissioning him for projects. Uh, Back in Florence, power had shifted again, Savonarola had been executed, and this change allowed artists to basically pursue work in Florence again, which leads us into the next big commission that Michelangelo had, and most of you may be familiar with, which is David. Uh, so in the, the Florentine Cathedral, the David Commission had been started by two other sculptors who actually failed and, you know, they, they didn't like what they had done. Um, and so they managed to leave the, like, available marble block in a almost unusable condition. In 1501, the job was given to Michelangelo, and it was like, all right, you fix this. And so he paused another project in Rome and returned to Florence for this job. He had often, you know, he often moved from place to place with his work in various states, which often landed him in legal trouble with his patrons. It's like, wait, why are you, wait, <laughs> hold on. I paid you to do this thing. Why are you leaving to do another thing? He's like, I found something better. <laughs> it's like, don't worry, I'll finish it. It's fine. Yeah, he's like, oh, this other thing's more interesting. Um, the, the original ADD yeah. king. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so the subject matter of David was up to this point typically portrayed with Goliath's head at David's feet. But that wasn't possible given the state of the marble. It was super messed up. Uh, and it had also deteriorated and grown rough after years of exposure to the elements um and so by the time michelangelo was working on it um he decided to depict david in the moments before the battle instead uh, and he worked on that project for three years um and it was a great success um something interesting about the david is that it was originally commissioned to line the roof of the cathedral of saint mary of the flower once the six-ton piece was completed, however, <laughs> it was clear that it would be nearly impossible to lift. Uh, this is partly why the hands are so huge. Like, when you look at it in person, um, the hands were for like, the hands were foreshortened, kind of, so that it would appear proportional when viewed from below. So when you look at it head-on, you're like, whoa, <laughs> those are some hands. Um <laughs> So, yeah. Um, this story is And then is the another best. <laughs> great little tidbit about Michelangelo's sort of temperament is uh, Piero Sardarini, the ruler of Florence, uh, said that the nose on David was too broad um, and that Michelangelo needed to make it smaller. And so Michelangelo went and picked up a little bit of marble dust and went up and pretended to chisel the nose. Tink, tink, tink. And let a little bit of dust fall. Um, and then Piero was like, it's perfect. It's great. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, he had changed nothing. So, um, yeah. I mean, the man Pretty started cheeky. his career with forgery, so I'm not surprised. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> yeah, he was not above a lie, for sure. Yeah. Uh, so 1503, Pope Julius II is elected in Rome, and he was kind of rebuilding the unstable 5th century Basilica of St. Peter's in the Vatican. And the centerpiece of this would be his tomb, which he wanted Michelangelo to design and carve. It was meant to be three stories high and covered in life-size sculptures, and Michelangelo would end up working on it for the next 40 years of his life. It took eight months to quarry the marble itself required for the project, and it ended up being smaller than originally intended. Uh, only three of the statues ended up being by Michelangelo. These ended up being the large bearded Moses and the biblical characters of Rachel and Leah. One important thing to note about Michelangelo's Moses is that it has horns, and this came from a long-standing tradition of anti-Semitism in which Jewish people were just portrayed as, quote, horned devils administering to Satan. So, thanks, Michelangelo. Woo! Uh, four years into the project, Julius commissioned the painting of the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel. And although 
Michelangelo was primarily a sculptor. Uh, was primarily a sculptor. The Pope chose him to do this, even though he hadn't worked with frescoes since his apprenticeship. And he was like, uh, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, he was not super enthused about the Sistine Chapel. <laughs> Um, so the Sistine Chapel depicts scenes from the Old Testament. Michelangelo planned out nine scenes from the book of Genesis, with the centerpiece being Adam's creation. He worked on this for four years. It was a grueling project in which he painted lying on his back um, on scaffolding. And so paint would drip onto his face. <laughs> so not not the best. Um so the Sistine Chapel ceiling, it's all frescoes, uh, which is a technique of mural painting, which is executed on freshly laid wet lime plaster. Uh, water is used as the vehicle for the dry powder pigment to merge with the plaster and with the setting of the plaster so that the painting becomes like a part of the wall. <laughs> uh, it's super time sensitive and it's painstaking work. Uh, in a letter to Giovanni da Pestoia, Michelangelo described just how much he saw the entire project as a pain in the ass. So this is when the author was painting the vault of the Sistine Chapel, 1509. I've already grown a goiter from this torture, hunched up here like a cat in Lombardy, or anywhere else where the stagnant waters poison. My stomach's squashed under my chin, my beard's pointing at heaven, my brain's crushed in a casket, my breast twists like a harpy's, my brush above me all the time dribbles paint so my face makes a fine floor for droppings. My haunches are grinding into my guts, my poor ass strains to work as a counterweight, every gesture I make is blind and aimless. My skin hangs loose below me. My spine's all knotted from folding over itself. I'm bent taut as a Syrian bow. Because I'm stuck like this, my thoughts are crazy. Perfidious tripe. Anyone shoots badly through a crooked blowpipe. My painting is dead. Defend it for me, Giovanni. Protect my honor. I am not in the right place. I am not a painter. You ever get paid to, like, do a piece of work that you hate so much that you <laughs> write an entire poem about it? Right. <laughs> uh, so part of the, the Sistine Chapel, um, the part of the Sistine Chapel that received the most criticism by far was a fresco on the wall which is called The Last Judgment. And it received a whole bunch of criticism because it depicted countless nude male figures and a whole bunch of BDSM overtures and imagery, like, all over it. Uh, the papal <laughs> master of ceremonies, a man named Biagio da Sassena, said the painting made the chapel look like a stufa de ignudi, or a, ba a bathhouse, basically. Um, <laughs> after hearing him say this criticism, Michelangelo supposedly put his face in the painting on Minos, the great judge of hell, and gave him donkey ears in the painting. Uh, it was basically like, okay, you're going to be an ass? I'm going to make you an ass. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, Michelangelo's uh, Sistine Chapel paintings are filled with many moments that make you go, what the fuck is happening here? <laughs> um, and definitely attests at least to his awareness of various sexualities. Um, in The Last Judgment on the wall behind the altar, to the left of Christ on the uh, the side, so the left side is where the damned are. Um, and among them are two pairs of nearly nude muscular gents in a lip-locking embrace in addition to an older bearded man staring longingly into the eyes of of a younger man. I mean, if you look at these images, there's no, I mean, it's just, it's so romantic the way they're looking at each other and embracing. And there's, there's also some, uh, yeah. some snakes biting penises mm -hmm. is the thing. Um, there's like whipping. It's, 
It's very much. Uh, there was a poet, uh, Pietro Aretino, who actually accused Michelangelo of, quote, desecrating the Sistine Chapel by turning it into a whorehouse with his naked figures. This isn't a quote directly from him, but this is a quote from an article that we really liked. Um, from a letter from him to Michelangelo, th- this is this is directly his words, and we had to include it because it's just, it's too good and too pearl clutchy to not include. He was like... <laughs> both really jealous of Michelangelo's success and also just, like, feigning pearl clutching uh, in this beautiful letter. The pagans, when they modeled a Diana, gave her clothes. When they made a naked Venus, hid the parts which are not shown with the hand of modesty. And here comes a Christian who, because he rates art higher than the faith, deems it a royal spectacle to portray martyrs and virgins in improper attitudes, to show men dragged down by their shame, before which things houses of ill fame would shut the eyes in order not to see them. Your art would be at home in some voluptuous bagnio, certainly not in the highest chapel of the world." Less criminal were it if you were an infidel than being a believer, thus to sap the faith of others. Up to the present time, the splendor of such audacious marvels hath not gone unpunished, for their very super-excellence is the death of your good name. Restore them to repute by turning the indecent parts of the damned to flames and those of the blessed to the sunbeams, or imitate the modesty of Florence, who hides your David's shame beneath some gilded leaves. Yet that statue is exposed upon a public square, not in a consecrated chapel. Okay. Yeah. I think it's important to point out when we when we say that the men were dragged down by their shame, we are talking about their penises. Yes. They were dragged they, to hell by their penises. By their, by their penises. <laughs> that, that's in the painting. Yes. Go, go look at it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> fun fact, uh, if you see the, the Sistine Chapel now, you will notice that there's there's not a huge amount of ding-dongs in it. Uh, and that is because in 1563, the Council of Trent forbade the representation of unsuitable subjects in churches. So a man named Daniela de Volterra was ordered to paint over all of the offending nudities. He basically got hired to paint on a bunch of underoos. Um, he was nicknamed Il Bragatoni, or the Britches Maker, aka, as we saw in one article, Danny the Panty Painter. Um, and Even more artists in the 17th and 18th centuries were tasked with adding more and more underwear and clothing to the fresco. Um, It's wild. You can actually see um, a version of it that it it was supposed to be before all of the censoring uh, that was done by one of Michelangelo's apprentices. Um, I can't remember. We'll we'll post a link to it, but Mm -hmm. you you can see what was what was changed. Right. Yeah, Pope. Pope Paul IV interpreted the Last Judgment as defaming the church, essentially, um, by suggesting that Jesus and those depicted around him communicated with God directly without the need of the church. So that was how, that was another reason why the artwork was controversial in its time. Um, He suspended Michelangelo's pension and as we mentioned, had fig leaves painted over all the nudes. Uh, So Michelangelo's relationship with the Catholic Church certainly became strained at this time as he grew to detest the corruption of the church and its wealth and opulence. Um, In two places in the Sistine Chapel, Michelangelo actually left self-portraits, both of them depicting... (laughs) himself in torture he hated this so much again drama and he hated doing this he gave his own face to saint bartholomew's body martyred by being skinned alive (laughs) so (laughs) same so there's literally just flayed flesh in this painting with michelangelo's face on it (laughs) um and then he's also depicted himself as Hall Fernie's severed head, who was seduced and beheaded by Judith. Needless to say, he was not super jazzed about painting frescoes, especially at this scale. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> it was a nightmare. So so going back to um to to Rome, uh Pope Julius died in 1516, and so we now have uh Pope Leo X, uh, who 
asked Michelangelo to design a new facade for the church of San Lorenzo in Florence. Um, while Michelangelo had no architectural experience whatsoever, he basically threw himself into the project and was furious when the project was put on hold and then cancelled. Meanwhile, you know, he's like running around the country, you know, with half done pieces all over. Um, the Pope gave him a replacement a replacement project, however, the Medici tombs, and he began work on those in 1519. I have just a couple of quotes here uh, from Michelangelo just about sculpture and like how much he loved it and thought that it was the best. Um, he said, every block of stone has a statue inside it, and it is the task of the sculpture to discover it. And, quote, the greatest artist has no conception which a single block of marble does not potentially contain within its mass, but only a hand obedient to the mind can penetrate to this image. So he, I mean, earlier we were talking about how he created his own myths in many ways. Mm -hmm. And this language is very much like he is, you know, looking at himself as an artist and, like, what he's able to do and sort of projecting out to everyone, like, wow, how incredibly special people who can do this are. And, um, yeah, I just think that's <laughs> really interesting. Yeah. He was not humble in any no, way, shape, or form. No, no. And we, we haven't really mentioned this uh, because we'll, we'll go into it more in the why do we think they're gay. But, I mean, he basically was just, like, bouncing around Italy from commission to commission. He didn't really have yeah. much of a personal life in terms of, like, he never married. Uh, mm -hmm. There's, you know, kind of myths in, in all of his biographies about him being, you know, very kind of like a frigid temperament and was, uh, you know, never interested in, in romance and was very uh, temperamental. And, you know, that wasn't, that wasn't an element of his life, at least in the official biographies. But we'll talk a little bit about that in just a few minutes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right, because there's a slightly different personality for him that that comes out of the letters and and the poems and things. Mm -hmm. So uh, very mu much more of a private version of him. Yeah. Um, so later in his life, at the height of his career in 1527, armies from France and the Holy Roman Empire invaded Italy. Rome was looted and burned, and the Pope sided with the Holy Roman Empire when it besieged Florence. So, Michelangelo returned to Florence to help defend the city, including designing new fortifications to protect the city. Still, um, Florence eventually fell, and he ended up going into hiding in a small crypt under the altar in the Medici Chapel in San Lorenzo. And he stayed there until he, like basically heard from the Pope that, like, the Pope mustn't mad at him anymore <laughs> or something. You ever, um, you ever hide yeah. from the Pope in a crypt? <laughs> <laughs> this, is, this is a singular experience that Michelangelo had. <laughs> you ever I just, mean, actually, you ever just hide? Yeah, There's no, probably I'm... plenty of people who hid from Popes. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Popes were, uh, <laughs> popes were quite vindictive in this time, I think. Yeah. They were, like, straight-up dangerous. <laughs> yeah. Um, so Michelangelo spent his later life writing poetry, working for the popes, eventually coming down with a fever, and he died in 1564 in Rome. Um, but his final wish was to have his body returned to Florence, the city that he loved. Yay! He died, he died late, like he was in his 80s. Yeah, yeah, yeah. he did. He lived longer than w is typical I think <laughs> yeah. it's all that marble dust. Yeah, all that marble dust. <laughs> Keep them young. All right. So now it is time for our "Why Do We Think They're Gay?" segment. So uh, first off, we should talk a little bit about what sexual identity during the Renaissance was like. So we've talked about this multiple times on the show. People didn't really conceive of themselves in terms of having a sexual identity. So when we consider this period in terms of sexuality, we're talking about patterns of behavior, cultural patterns, artistic production conditions, and the chosen subjects and themes that artists were representing. Uh, as our favorite resident gay historian, Richter Norton, says about this time period and its misogynistic culture, quote, It was a phallic culture, with columns, columns everywhere. 
Every available niche in every building was stuffed with an erect statue. Every tomb was an assertion of virility. So, <laughs> dudes, everywhere. Phalluses, penises. Yeah. We could have also just called this, you know, this, this episode Columns, Columns Everywhere. I, that <laughs> yes. makes me just want to be like, column, col- Columns, Columns Everywhere, and not a woman to drink. Something, I don't know. Yeah, I know. <laughs> like, how, do we, how do we finish that? <laughs> yes. Um, Michael Rock's study of 15th century Florence <laughs> indicates that, quote, males were in general rather flexible about the biological sex of the objects of their desire, end quote. And in particular, Florence was a hotbed of same-sex activity, at least among men. <laughs> <laughs> and it earned a reputation as a modern Sodom uh, Rock's study of 15th century Florence estimates that two of every three males left some legal record of sodomy. <laughs> Basically, that they had been charged with it. Florence some, was the place some point. to be. So there was a Florentine tribunal for the prosecution of sodomy um, that was dissolved in 1502, but not because it had outlived its purpose and was no longer needed, but because, quote, institutionalization had resulted in unwelcome publicity <laughs> rather than erasure, end quote. So basically, once you name a thing, well, there it is, and there's no going back. And it it actually had this effect of, like, kind of putting the idea out there and, you know, like, this is happening. <laughs> and so people just more aware of it. Um, and then... So the use of the word sodomy was used to describe all same-sex intimacy between males in this period. Thus, as Michael Rock notes in Forbidden Friendships, Homosexuality, and Male Culture in Renaissance Florence, the words homosexual or queer are considered perfectly accurate and meaningful equivalents for the 15th century and 16th century Italian terms for inveterate sodomite, infamous sodomite and notorious sodomite whose existence is well documented in Michael Rock's book. Uh, Richard Norton, who we mentioned earlier, also notes that, quote, although Rock is a, so he he's talking about um, Rock's study and sort of further trying to bring the point home that this language is appropriate to use today in talking about this period. Although Rock is a social constructionist and contends that homosexuals did not constitute a sexually distinct minority with regard to the large majority of men who engaged in homosexual relations, even he nevertheless admits that the category of inveterate sodomites did in fact constitute a distinct minority. This is Rock's phrase for them, an important concession. Of older sodomites who were so dedicated to exclusive homosexuality throughout their lives and who lived and worked in sodomitical neighborhoods <laughs> and frequented sodomitical cruising grounds, that it can be said to have formed an important factor in their self-identity. So I think that's just a really important, like, <laughs> historical touchstone to sort of, like, connect um, the everything that we're talking about to, like, modern language right yeah you had a you had a um, subset putting it in context you had a subset of these men in florence who made their same-sex behavior as much a part of their identity as mm -hmm. you know we we probably see now in gay male culture so there's this this, right. this kind of bridge that's being created Mm -hmm. Um, the next thing we, we got to talk about is androgyny and gender in Michelangelo's art or in general art that was going on at the time, or as we like to call it, what even is a titty? <laughs> um, so at this time, the adolescent male youth was considered the ideal beauty going back to these Roman and Greek, um, ideals in antiquity. Uh, androgyny and gender in Renaissance art and society were, was that was basically the name of the game, uh, and is part of the reason why Michelangelo's women look masculine and the breasts appear kind of tacked on. Uh, androgyny was ideal for both men and women, uh, 
a Renaissance humanist, Mario Equicola, wrote in 1525 that, quote, the effeminate male and the manly female are graceful in almost every aspect, which was a view that was commonly held by all of his peers. There are many examples of iconic androgynous figures in Renaissance art. You have Donatello's David, who stands leaning, leg forward, with a hand on his hip, and a soft, round little belly. And you've got Michelangelo's intense and hyper-realized androgyny in his Sistine Chapel frescoes, um, which may be a reason why his peers found the work so influential. Michelangelo also did study male models even for his female figures. And this was typical of the time because it was, it was illegal basically for like a woman to be naked in front of a bunch of dudes. Um, (laughs) But androgynous bodies were like considered beautiful and the androgyny of Michelangelo's figures is an intentional choice. But this also, you know, he may just have, I mean, all of his figures were male and it was like, okay, how do we, uh, let's, let's cut a grapefruit in half and stick it on there for (laughs) boobs. Um, (laughs) I like to call them marble boobs. Marble boobs. They just, they just look like marbles. They're just like, what are you doing? What are you doing there? Why are you here? (laughs) Yeah. I, I I like to, it's just like, it's a, it's like grapefruit size. There's no weight to them. They're just literally just tacked on. That is a really good, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, there are plenty of images of feminine-looking young men in the Renaissance that showed the interest in male androgyny, too. Many of Leonardo da Vinci's male figures look feminine. For example, his John and the Baptist, which he worked on from 1513 to 1516. The ideal... Uh, also, we, we have, you know, here's our fun misogyny coming in. Uh, there was this idea that the normative human body was male, and women's bodies were, like, imperfect versions of men's um you know see eve created from adam's rib uh for this reason in early anatomical books the book the bodies used to demonstrate human physiology are always male unless of course you're studying the you know reproductive system that is assigned to Mm -hmm. you know female persons um unless you know that is specifically being studied patriarchy Mm -hmm. right patriarchy it's it's always been there it's still there (laughs) something's never changed yeah um yeah so one of the one of the things that we have from michelangelo are our personal artworks that he made for close friends and presentation drawings um and and these are really interesting in terms of looking at his personal relationships. Michelangelo used presentation drawings to celebrate his relationships with Vittoria Colonna and Tommaso di Cavalieri, the only two people for whom he is documented as having created a unique work of art. Um, He wrote many erotic poems, and his poetry is where much of the compelling evidence comes from um, for his sexual preferences. Um, Although we don't have any explicit information about his sexual activities. Um, So presentation drawings were a new form of graphic art at the time in which artists would make a drawing as a, quote, finished expression of private thoughts to a specific individual, end quote. So they were intended as a kind of communication between two close people. It's basically the Renaissance equivalent of sending a note, passing a note to somebody in your class that says, do you like me? Yes, no. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was, it it was, you know, it, it, it probably required slightly more interpretation than that, <laughs> right? But, but yeah, it totally is. It's like, hey, I like you. Here's a drawing, which I think is... Really nice. It wasn't just Michelangelo's art that kind of gave him away. Um, he had a pretty significant reputation for queerness among his contemporaries. In a letter to Niccolo Quaratesi, Michelangelo tells the story of how a father described his son to the artist, hoping to convince him to take the boy on as an apprentice, appealing to Michelangelo's well-known inclinations. In this letter, he says that the father said to him, once you saw him, you'd chase him into bed the minute you got home. What a way to advertise your son. <laughs> You're like, hey, 
Um, and then we have our, our good friend Pietro uh, Pietro Aretino, the pearl clutchy fun fun guy, uh, commenting on the nude cherubs in the Sistine Chapel, um, specifically pointing barbs at Michelangelo's godlessness, even uh, saying specifically, even if you are divine, you don't disdain male consorts. Ooh. <laughs> uh, Michelangelo himself often denounced these rumors, and when a contemporary said that his queerness was inextricably linked to his appreciation of the male form, like, all right, we know that you're into dudes, because, like, oh my god, you keep drawing dudes and ding-dongs everywhere. Uh, He (laughs) countered, whose judgment would be so barbarous as not to appreciate that the foot of a man is more noble than his boot, and his skin more noble than that of a sheep with which he is dressed? Methinks you doth protest a little too much, Mikey Mike. If you're sitting here, be like, exactly. why wouldn't I draw a naked dude? Because that's just so much more interesting than a clothed dude. I mean, it's basically like, naked dudes are great. Duh. Duh. <laughs> Besotted with beefcake. This is really not helping you out, dude. Yeah. <laughs> So much of what we know about Michelangelo's queer desire from his poems and writings has had to be quite literally unerased (laughs) from history because of the deliberate heterosexualizing of the text. Yeah, so in 1863, an art historian named John Addington Simmons was granted access to the Buonarotti family archives in Florence, and it was there that he actually found a margin note in a manuscript of poems from Michelangelo's grandnephew, named Michelangelo the Younger, uh, that said, what what is he going to do when he's older? Michelangelo the Younger, now old? (laughs) Um, That's a good question. (laughs) The artist formerly known as Michelangelo the Younger. Um, And so this, this margin note said that Michelangelo's poems must not be published in their original form because of their expression of, quote, amor virile, a.k.a. masculine love. With Simmons' discovery, it showed that Michelangelo the Younger's attempts to posthumously publish his great uncle's poetry involved actually changing the masculine pronouns to feminine ones in the love poems. As Richter Norton quotes, Michelangelo the Younger's action proves that the hetero-homo divide was not only relevant, but important for him and his Renaissance contemporaries. Michelangelo the Younger's censorship provides as much evidence as is needed to prove that Michelangelo's sonnets were perceived during his own time as the product of a man who fucked men, and the charge of anachronism completely falls apart. Thank you, Richter Norton. So let's, you know, we're, we're, we're talking about, like, relationships that are showing up in these poems. Uh, what, what were these relationships? We have bits and bobs about Michelangelo's relationships with various apprentices and models that worked with him throughout his artistic career. So we'll talk a little bit about uh, a couple of these. Mostly it's just little tidbits and then there's one big one. Uh, so we have Gerardo Perini who came to work for Michelangelo around 1520 as a model, and their relationship and working partnership lasted until the mid-1530s. Some of Michelangelo's own writing shows his yearning for Perini, displaying how he would basically stay up at night racked with anxiety on days where Perini didn't come to the studio. We have a piece of writing from him that says, I beg you not to make me draw this evening since Perino's not here. He couldn't do it without his muse. Uh, On a drawing dated 1520 to 1525, a fragment of poetry believed to be about Perini reads, Only I remain burning in the dusk, after the sun has stripped the world of its rays, whereas other men take their pleasure, I do but mourn, prostrate on the ground, lamenting and weeping. Uh, A prominent Michelangelo scholar, Robert C. Clements, believes that Michelangelo's affair with Perini was expressly queer, and you can see this in his books Michelangelo's Theory of Art, Michelangelo, A Self-Portrait, and The Poetry of Michelangelo, and points to some verse from 1520 to 1530-ish that was most likely written to Perini, writing, I had always thought I could come to terms with love. Now I suffer, and you see how I burn. Um, Michelangelo's affair with Phoebo... Di Poggio, another young model, began in the early 1530s, ending about 1534. Michelangelo jokingly called him, quote, a little blackmailer, end quote. Super cute nickname. (laughs) Um, Michelangelo was essentially a sugar daddy (laughs) for this guy. 
Um, a vindictive and sassy ass as ever, Michelangelo wrote on a page with financial calculations, quote, Here with his beautiful eyes, he promised me solace, and with those very eyes, he tried to take it away from me. <laughs> Their relationship came to an end when Michelangelo felt that De Poggio had betrayed him, perhaps by stealing money or drawings, as Norton writes, perhaps, quote, the artist felt humiliated by his subservience to the model, end quote. He wrote several poems utilizing puns on Phoebo's name, like in this one, which describes him falling on a hill, which is Poggio in Italian means hill, and exhausting himself, suggestive of physical consummation. Blithe bird, excelling us by fortune's sway, of Phoebus, thine the prize of lucent notion, sweeter yet the boon of winged promotion, to the hill whence I topple and decay. Easily could I soar with such a happy fate when Phoebus brightened up the heights. His feathers were wings and the hill the stair. Phoebus was a lantern to my feet. Yeah. Because of their eroticism, <laughs> um, Joseph Tuziani in his edition of Michelangelo's Complete Poems uh, in 1960, went out of his way to argue that these poems were addressed to Vittoria Colonna, a woman Michelangelo was involved with much later in his life. Mm -hmm. So that doesn't really hold up. Yeah, and throughout that poem, I mean, we have, you know, an English translation, but Poggio uh, shows up multiple times. We have it showing up in, you know, the hill. Um, it's also the heights and the hill and the stair. So he's definitely, right. like, hammering it through. Other potential lovers of Michelangelo may have included Francesco Urbino, his servant and companion, Bartolomeo Bettini, to whom he gifted a drawing of Venus and Cupid, and an 18-year-old boy named Andrea Quaratesi. Uh, letters between the two uh, show that Andrea Quaratesi was actually like infatuated with Michelangelo and once wrote that he wanted to, quote, crawl on all fours to see him one night in 1532. Michelangelo also had a relationship with a youth who was 13 years old named Francesco di Zenobi Bracci, who Michelangelo nicknamed Cicino. In a letter to Cicino's uncle, Michelangelo once described him as, quote, the flame who consumes me, end quote. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, <laughs> how else can you, I mean, is that really like in any time the way that people talk to their friends. Like, uh, maybe. <laughs> oh, yeah. No, you're totally the flame that consumes me, Amanda. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Chichino died in 1544, and for a full year after his death, Michelangelo wrote about 60 epitaphs for his tomb, on which he wrote, quote, Buried here is that Bracci with whose face God wished to correct nature, end quote. Aww. One version of a rejected quatrain for the tomb shows allusions to their shared bed. Quote, the earthly flesh and here my bones deprived of their charming face and beautiful eyes do yet attest for him how gracious I was in bed when he embraced in what the soul doth live. This wasn't the final version that went on to the tomb. However, fearing backlash, Michelangelo included a note to the boy's uncle, Luigi del Riccio, to burn the last two lines of the epitaph in the fire without witness. <laughs> so that's a quote. Quote, in the fire without witness, end quote. And replace them with the lines that were more abstract. Quote, do yet attest that grace and delight was I. In what a prison here the, do the soul doth live. When Michelangelo learned that Riccio was planning to publish the epitaphs without the edits, he begged him to, to destroy them, fearing that he, quote, certainly have the power to disgrace me, end quote. So definitely some anxiety there. Yeah, just a little bit. About um, being outed, essentially. So perhaps the most significant relationship we see in Michelangelo's life, however, was with a man named Tommaso de Cavalieri, whom he met at the age of 57. 
Cavalieri was a young Roman noble. He was 40 years younger than Michelangelo, so Tommaso was 17 at the time. And he became a very close friend to Michelangelo from 1532 up until Michelangelo's death in 1564. Michelangelo sent Tommaso more than 300 sonnets, letters, and drawings in which he expressed his love for him. There's a really great source that we used, Isaac Lowen, uh, who has an, an essay named Michelangelo and Tommaso Calavieri, The Dual Nature of Love and Desire, in which he explains how Michelangelo's desire for Cavalieri was one of yearning and intense, if not necessarily reciprocated, love, and steeped in conventional Petrarchan language. So here's a, here's a quote from him. Here, Michelangelo expresses the dual nature of love as both uplifting and destructive, with repeated themes of the ascent to heaven and subsequent fall to hell, of wings and the lack thereof, and of fire as both death and rebirth. Such paradoxes are common conceits for love, and its simultaneously debilitating and rejuvenating qualities in Petrarchan poetry, a tradition in which the speaker pines for a forbidden love that is never to be realized, with the object of desire being more an abstraction than a real person. Likewise, platonic love, in this context purely intellectual and non-sexual love between men, is similarly socially acceptable. Because he expressed love in these conventional terms, the poetry and gift drawings cannot be read as strictly confessional, and yet... The ambiguous nature of the language of love suggests that Michelangelo's affection transcended the acceptable platonic love between men, extending into the realm of romantic and physical desire. Michelangelo's expression of the dual nature of love reveals a conflict between erotic and platonic desire during the Cavalieri period. So this is important to note. So he's experiencing a lot of tension there. The two of them had an especially intimate friendship and relationship, which was actually acknowledged and recognized by their contemporaries. Giorgio Vasari, who was Michelangelo's biographer during his lifetime, stated that he loved Cavalieri infinitely more than his other friends. A letter from Tommaso to Michelangelo indicates that even though he may not have reciprocated the erotic love that Michelangelo most likely had for him, he nonetheless picked up on it and loved Michelangelo deeply, writing... I do believe, nay, I am certain, that the cause of the affection you have for me is this, that since you are most virtuous, or better, an embodiment of virtue itself, you are compelled to love those who believe in it, and love it, including myself. And in this, depending on my powers, I do not yield to many people. So, there were a series of homoerotic presentation drawings that were made for Tommaso. And they depicted pagan myths or allegories instead of Christian themes, which is something of note. <laughs> um, so we're going to talk about two of the drawings here. And the first is the punishment of Titius. Is that how I say that? Tid how do you say that? I don't know, but I like Titius. <laughs> yeah. Um, so the in the myth, the giant Titius Titus was punished for attempting to rape Lotto, mother of Apollo and Diana, by being chained to a rock in Hades. Every day, a vulture would rip out his liver, the seat of lust. Every night, the liver would grow back for the torment to be repeated the next day for all eternity. The drawing could be interpreted as a representation of pining and a love that will never be realized. Since the liver is continuously pecked out only to grow back again, forever. <laughs> and the liver is often referred to as, quote, seat of the passions, end quote, for whatever reason. I'm not really sure why the liver is like, I mean, don't you, the liver, the don't, seat of don't you feel butterflies in your liver every time you <laughs> get a crush on someone? I'm, I'm generally not super aware of my liver. <laughs> I don't think. <laughs> um, but yeah, so, so the scene could refer to Michelangelo's sort of unrequited love. Um, and then there is the rape of Ganymede, uh, who was a cupbearer for Zeus. Uh, Zeus, Zeus fell into such lust for the young cupbearer that he took on the form of an eagle to sweep him off to Mount Olympus to be with him. <laughs> Ganymede could represent the young cavalieri, and the eagle could represent the mature and overpowering Michelangelo, 
making it a visual representation of Michelangelo's physical desire for him. Mm-hmm. And the rape of Gam- the rape of Ganymede is a huge thing in um, this time. And as we've seen earlier and and later, I mean, kind of all throughout queer male history, there are a lot of allusions to this specific myth. We've talked about it um, with. Mm-hmm. Oscar Wilde. We've talked about it with with uh, Claude Cahoon. I believe had some some discussion of the rape of Ganymede when discussing uh, Uranian topics. So this tracks. <laughs> yes, yes, it does. Um, and then I, I will mention um, there's also a theory that these are drawings that Tommaso was meant to trace to learn how to draw because Michelangelo did teach Tommaso how to draw. Um, And that was, as we've said, pretty common for people to trace the drawings of their mentors or teachers. Um, I don't see why both of those things couldn't be true. Um, (laughs) You know, there's one that um, I can't remember which one exactly, but there is a drawing on the back that Tommaso did. He was basically tracing it. Um, so I don't think that that necessarily negates any of the homoerotic overtones in the drawings. Um, but I think it's just an interesting note. Uh, in addition to the presentation drawings, there's also some hints of Michelangelo's relationship with Cavalieri in some of his sculpture, uh, including one called The Genius of Victory, which was completed from 1532 to 1534. Many scholars suggest that the figures in Michelangelo's victory statue in the tomb of Julius II are actually modeled on Cavalieri, who is the standing figure, and Michelangelo, who's kneeling. Um, We'll put a picture of this in our show notes, but if you look at it, it's Hard to miss the obviously erotic elements of this statue, depicting Michelangelo basically kneeling between Cavalieri's legs. And uh, there's like a whole bunch of articles (laughs) specifically talking about this one sculpture, which is great. Uh, Moving on, we have uh, some letters specifically from Michelangelo to Tommaso, and I wanted to give a, a... an excerpt from one of them that just really shows in his own words how Michelangelo felt about Cavalieri. So this is from July 28th, 1533. My dear Lord, had I not believed that I had made you certain of the very great, nay, measureless love I bear you, I would not have seemed... It would not have seemed strange to me, nor have roused astonishment to observe the great uneasiness you show in your last letter, lest, through my not having written, I should have forgotten you. Still, it is nothing new or marvelous, when so many other things go counter, that this should also be topsy-turvy. For what your lordship says to me, I could say to yourself. Nevertheless, you do this perhaps to try me, or to light a new and stronger flame, if that indeed were possible. But be it as it will, I know that well, at this hour, I could as easily forget your name as the food by which I live. Nay, it were easier to forget the food, which only nourishes my body miserably, than your name, which nourishes body and soul, filling the one and the other with such sweetness that neither weariness nor fear of death is felt by me while memory preserves you to my mind. Think, if the eyes could also enjoy their portion, in what condition I should find myself. So this is basically, hey, you haven't written to me in a while, and so I'm guessing that you're doing this to make me just, like, really like you a whole lot more and pine after you. Um, Also, I love you more than food. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Which I'm pretty sure is, like, the best expression of love. Really saying yeah. something. In 1532, he began wooing Cavalieri, wrote, writing to him, May I burn if I do not love thee with all my heart, and lose my soul if I feel for any other. It's completely heterosexual. Uh, Mm -hmm. In the many, many sonnets that he wrote to Cavalieri, Michelangelo referred to the immeasurable love that he carried for the young nobleman. And he even, much like he did with Poggio, frequently used Cavalieri's name in a pun to describe his affections and desire to be with him. Like in this one from Sonnet 98. If to be happy I must be conquered and chained, it is no wonder that naked and alone an armed cavalier's prisoner I remain. 
which again with the BDSM, there's Fantastic. a lot of like, <laughs> yes. he's really into a lot of submission. Let's just say. Yeah. There's another translation of this poem. Why should I seek to ease intense desire with still more tears and windy words of grief when heaven or late or soon sends no relief to souls whom love hath robed round with fire? Why need my aching heart to death aspire when all must die? Nay, death beyond belief unto these eyes would be both sweet and brief, since in my sum of woes all joys expire. Therefore, because I cannot shun the blow, I rather seek, say, who must rule my breast, gliding between her gladness and her woe. If only chains and bands can make me blessed, no marvel if alone and bare I go, an armed cavalier's captive and slave confessed. So, like the myth of Titios, Michelangelo writes in this sonnet presenting a theme of descent to hell, so we're going back to that Petrarchan language, for his carnal passion that is beyond platonic love. And as Lowen so eloquently notes, quote, writes that the bliss of submitting to desire is worth the punishment. And there is another poem uh, written for Tommaso. Now it's too late for you to remove my woes, for a heart that's burning and has burned for many years will turn into, even if reason finally damps it, no longer a heart, but ashes and charred wood. And this also was written for Tommaso. It's entitled Love the Light Giver. With your fair eyes, a charming light I see, for which my own blind eyes would peer in vain. Stayed by your feet the burden I sustain, which my lame feet find all too strong for me. Wingless upon your pinions forth I fly. Heavenward your spirit stirreth me to strain. E'en as you will, I blush and blanch again. Freeze in the sun, burn neath a frosty sky. Your will includes and is the Lord of mine. Life to my thoughts within your heart is given. My words begin to breathe upon your breath. Like to the moon am I, that cannot shine. Alone, for lo, our eyes see not in heaven, save what the living sun illumineth. And then the final one that we have here uh, in terms of poetry is Love Misinterpreted. If the undying thirst that purifies our mortal thoughts could draw mine to the day, perchance the Lord, who now holds cruel sway in love's high house, would prove more kindly wise. But since the laws of heaven immortalize our souls and doom our flesh to swift decay, tongue cannot tell how fair, how pure as day is the soul's thirst that far beyond it lies." How then, ah, woe is me, shall that chaste fire which burns the heart within me be made known, if sense finds only sense in what it sees? All my fair hours are turned to miseries with my loved Lord, who minds but lies alone, for truth to tell, who trusts not, is a liar. We're coming to to the end of things here, Um, so we wanted to talk a little bit about Michelangelo's later life and his, like, religious devotion, internal conflicts about his his desire, and his later renouncement of his quote-unquote sins. Michelangelo heavily identified with the figure of Nicodemus, who was a Pharisee and a member of the Sanhedrin, mentioned in three places in the Gospel of John. He first visits Jesus one night to discuss Jesus's teachings, And Nicodemus reminds his colleagues in the Sanhedrin that the law requires that a person be heard before being judged. And Nicodemus appears after the crucifixion of Jesus to provide the customary embalming spices and assists Joseph in preparing the body for burial. In the Florentine Pietà sculpture he made later in his life, he included a self-portrait of himself as Nicodemus. Uh, So the Nicodemists... Uh, were active in Italy in the 1540s and early 1550s. Um, and they showed, they were a group that showed interest in some of the ideas of the Protestant reformers, um, but sought to act within the existing Catholic order. So they weren't ready to, <laughs> they weren't, uh, ready to go full, <laughs> full force. Um, thus preventing a schism in the church. 
Michelangelo's identification with Nicodemus um, and his also his involvement with the Catholic even evangelist reform movement in Italy um, shows that he was interested in these ideas. Um, and it provides also an alternative explicit explanation for Michelangelo's attempted destruction of the sculpture in 1555. Um, I think also, though, his his assistant, who he was very close to, died around that same time. And so it's also theorized that he was angry and he was angry about the death and he smashed the sculpture with a hammer in anger. The influence of the Counter-Reformation, his like repentance of past sins, was in part inspired by meeting a woman named Vittoria Colonna around 1538, when he was 63 and she was around 47 and 48. Vittoria was a married, educated noblewoman who became a famous female poet of 16th century Italy and served as a spiritual mentor to Michelangelo. She was also in favor of the church reform that was going on. She was described as a, quote, looming column that stands firm amid the raging of a storm. In part, due to her influence, Michelangelo sought a more personal relationship with God. Later in his life, he would express shame about the cult of beauty he had subscribed to and the divine inspiration that was attributed to him. So he kind of really backtracked a whole bunch of things. Uh, William Hood described this tension as, quote, Michelangelo's painful wrestling with his conclusion that the means of earthly love open to him could not provide the imminent metaphor of heavenly love that the comforts of marriage bring to most men and women. So he was also, as this church reformation was going on, he was also really concerned that his reputation would basically be besmirched because of all of the rumors of his homosexuality. Um, so we really see that in the later part of his life. We really didn't want to go too much into it because it's kind of sad to be like, hey, uh, <laughs> never mind. Um, Jesus is great. Naked dudes suck. Um, mm. But yeah. Uh, yeah. So there's, there's, there it is. There's the story of Michelangelo in as, as brief a time as we, if we could say, there's <laughs> yeah. so much to say about his life and his art. We just wanted to kind of give a, a general overview here in terms of pop culture tie in. It's, uh, I mean, Michael, it's Michelangelo. Michelangelo's kind of everywhere. <laughs> um, so yeah, I mean, creation of Adam, you see that everywhere, right? Um, the sort of symbol of of Michelangelo's David is in its use in gay culture. Um, really, since the seventies, has been a sort of icon <laughs> of gay culture. Um, that I found an interesting. Uh, so, in the Michelangelo phenomenon is an interpersonal process. Observe. So, this was named by psychologists. <laughs> Um, after Michelangelo. It's an interpersonal process observed by psychologists in which close romantic partners influence or, quote, sculpt each other. Over time, the Michelangelo effect causes individuals to develop towards what they consider their ideal selves. Um, so that's kind of interesting <laughs> that the field of psychology um, has somehow latched on to this this myth about Michelangelo, <laughs> um, a little bit, and um, the sort of romanticizing of him and his life. Yeah, there's, um, I mean, there's countless representations of him uh, all mm -hmm. over. I don't think, though, I, we could not find anything that was specifically like depictions of him and his relationship with Tommaso de Cav Cavalieri. So. Um, you know, find it in the poems. Really find it. There's there's more information about how these were, you know, basically erased. Um, and the I mean, I can't read Italian, so it's difficult. But <laughs> if you really look into a lot of the translations and the way that it was kind of covered up by Michelangelo the Younger, um, Richter Norton puts forth some really great sources to go into that. So Amanda. 
we've come to to the end of our time together. Um, and if you listen to the show in if you've listened to this show in the last I, God almost year that I've been having guest hosts, <laughs> um, when we have someone who hosts on this show for the first time, we haze them lovingly by making them go first <laughs> in our "How Gay Were They" segment. So, okay. Amanda, I am here to ask you definitively, once and for all, for everyone to listen to, how gay was Michelangelo? Hmm. Um, I think Michelangelo is pretty gay. I mean, I think I would give him like five out of five Davids <laughs> uh, on that. Uh, <laughs> I think that the sort of misogyny and homosocial nature of Renaissance Italy provided like the perfect conditions for same sex intimacy, especially between men, to really flourish. And I think that that situation was a natural complement to Michelangelo's orientation towards other men, intellectually, romantically, and sexually. And I think that he struggled with it in a way that many contemporary queers struggle with their queerness and their identity. Um, he just did it during the Renaissance. And so it looks the way it does right. <laughs> <laughs> because it was the Renaissance. <laughs> um, and, you know, it requires us to do a little bit more digging, a little bit more reading between the lines. Um, but us queers know how to do that. We've had to do that. <laughs> We've had to do that for just like a little bit of time. <laughs> Forever. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yep. So, Lee, uh, how gay was Michelangelo? You know, I think... I'm going to say Michelangelo was 12 out of 10 penis biting snakes <laughs> that drag you down to the depths of hell. <laughs> There's just I mean, yes. We look at we look at the art of Michelangelo even though it was prevalent at the time to include androgyny in artwork it's very very clear just specifically the way that michelangelo surrounded himself with male models and didn't even know how to how to you know realistically render breasts um that women were not <laughs> and, he and he didn't, didn't care. care women <laughs> he didn't women care were not in his periphery <laughs> he didn't care at all and there's mm -hmm. such a there, there's there's such a common thread of, oh, well, women weren't involved in this person's life, so they must have been frigid, they must have been abstinent, they must have been X, Y, Z, as opposed to, like, maybe just like dudes. And I really feel <laughs> yeah. like we see so much of that in the poetry. I had always had this idea around Michelangelo being queer because of what's just prevalent and in, in, in visible in his artwork and kind of right. this, this air of it and like, yeah, everybody in the Renaissance was super gay. And the <laughs> discovery for myself of his very specific writings is really where I was surprised to see it. I, I didn't really know where to start with my research because I was like, well, I mean, everybody knows that Michelangelo is gay, right? So, but where do we find that? That was new for me mm -hmm. to find that there mm -hmm. was the literal heterosexualizing of his poetry and even that he had his own anxiety around that in the um, discussion of like Cecchini's epitaphs and writing to his uncle saying, wait, no, that was, sorry, that was that was too gay. I'm afraid I'm going to get massacred for this. Please yeah. change those yeah. writings. And there's, we didn't go into it a whole lot, but there's, I mean, he wrote to Chichino's uncle several times to be like, please do not, please do mm -hmm. not do this. It will besmirch me. I'm afraid. And this was, you know, closer to the later times in his life too, where he was starting right, to kind yeah. of backtrack, walk back, all these things. And I mean, also just, how can you look at the Sistine Chapel and be like, ah, yes, a heterosexual did yeah. this? <laughs> <laughs> yes, we we will definitely include, like, in the show notes, the the sort of close-up detail shots of The Last Judgment, because there's just a lot of really fun stuff in that in Yeah, that it's, it's definitely a Where's um, Waldo of um, hedonism, yeah, I'll say. Can you find the uh, flayed flesh? <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> it's like a really dark 
<laughs> I mean, there's literally a por- a portion where it just looks like some guy's just jamming his entire arm into another dude's butt. Like, yeah. you yeah. know, there you go. Yep. <laughs> with that, with our level, lovely uh, ending on fisting imagery, that's it <laughs> for today's episode. That Excellent. was how yeah, how appropriate. Uh, a little rough uh, around the edges. Um, <laughs> hopefully not like fisting hopefully you use a lot of lube um (laughs) that's it for today's episode you can find us online individually amanda please let our lovely listeners at home know where they can find more info about you on the internet and in the worldwide web of queer fun yeah um if you would like to follow me on instagram i am oryx bessia and that's O R Y X B E S I A. <laughs> Bonus points if you have any idea what that means. Um, and then I also have a website that's just amandahelton.com. Yay. And History is Gay Podcast can be found on Tumblr at History is Gay Podcast, Twitter at History is Gay Pod, and you can drop us a line with questions, suggestions, or just to say hi, or, as I mentioned in the beginning of this, alternative titles for this episode that involve Ninja Turtle puns at History is Gay Podcast at gmail.com. If you enjoy the show and want to support us in continuing to make it, you can support us on Patreon, where you can get access to Safa's Salon minisodes, special sneak peeks, the opportunity to have your voice show up on the show, and more. You can become a patron by going to the support section on our website and join the ranks of our amazing Patreon community, along with Ender Raccoon and Anna Hetzel. Thank you so much for your support. It helps us with editing. It helps us with researching. I'm forever amazed that people are lending their funds to help us continue to make this show. You can also buy awesome merch at our History is Gay store, as well as uh, fun bits from our History is Gay coloring book. Click on shop on our website. And lastly, remember to rate, review, and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. It helps more people find the show, and we can expand our awesome community. So, Amanda, would you uh, would you like to help me close out this show and say goodbye to everyone? Yes, of course. All right. That's it for History is Gay. Until next time. Stay queer. And stay curious. 